Hey friends, Powwow Guy here, Rob Phoenix. Um, another special video. Uh, today we have another powwower, Jason David, who is in Connecticut. Jason, hi. And uh, this is awesome for me because I'm actually not the only powwow guy in the world. A couple of months ago, we interviewed uh, Michael Meehan from Philadelphia. Remember the Philadelphia Browker, the Philly Browker. Uh, so tonight we have Jason David. So Jason, awesome to talk to you finally. We've talked for years online, but this is like rare that we get to see each other face to face. So I'm pretty excited about this. It's two of us. I'm pretty honored. And uh, it's been a long time coming, so I'm excited. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, so we don't have an agenda tonight. We just want to talk about some random things, go through some emails, laugh at ourselves maybe a little bit. Uh, but one thing I am curious about that I have to ask you, I mean, just for the sake of people watching, um, how is powwow different in Connecticut than it is in Pennsylvania? That's a really great question. And I think on the surface, um, Powwow, I wouldn't say is non-existent here. Um, I have spoken to several people who were of Germanic origin, and I, none of them have any connection to the Pennsylvania Dutch. But um, some of the things they shared were just identical to what powwows do. Um, so I don't think that the practice itself is non-existent. Um, but the tradition, I don't think, is here. I think it's just like a few oral, a few oral traditions passed down through the families and kind of shared. I don't think there's really a set systematic methodology like Pennsylvania Dutch has. Uh, one of the things it was always my understanding that New England is called New England for a reason. Like you have a lot of English settlers there. So mm -hmm. my assumption and i could be wrong but my assumption was always that um more of the english cunning magic is what you might find up there which of course was the ancestor of powwow so you're i i always imagined it'd be a little more cunning man cunning craft blended with powwow i don't know if that's accurate or not but uh I wouldn't necessarily say blended with Powell. I, I think New England is is almost like a mecca for for witchcraft. Um, obviously, we have Salem, Connecticut, was where the very first witch in the United States was was hanged and executed, and so there's it's really prominent. The cunning folk tradition in itself um, is is actually it's sparse. There are some pretty academic people out here that uh, work in the tradition. Um, and it is extremely similar to, to powwow. Um, I think one of the major variances that I find between cunning folk practitioners here and the Pennsylvania Dutch practitioners of powwow is the faith-based practice. While cunning folk tradition is very Christian-based, it's not as pagan as some, some folks would like to have others believe. Um, it is historically Christian, and that's really continued. But unlike powwow, it's not wholly based on that. There's, there's no questions of, do you believe in God? Someone comes to you, they have this issue, whether it be something in their marriage or there's something lost or even they feel like they're cursed. Um, you receive payment for that. You do the work. You go on your way. Their faith is irrelevant in that, in that practice. But for a powwow, that is something that's important. So, right. okay, so it's more. So I guess the difference, one of the differences, anyway, might be like cunning craft is a little more sort of magically oriented or more dependent on the practitioner, whereas powwow, you kind of have to have that belief on both sides. Um, little freeze up. It's okay. Little glitch. That's all right. All right. So, yeah, yeah so anyway. I, I think you hit the nail on the head there for sure. Um, you know, that, that is a very large difference between the two is the Paolo is, is wholly um, reliant upon what God is doing. And in Cunning Craft, an individual can essentially um, open up the grimoires, begin to work in that. There's no, it's not really dependent upon 
God or faith. It is very much their own ability for sure. All right. All right. So uh, you mentioned witches. God, I got to tell you, witches <laughs> here in Pennsylvania, it's a different, it's a different world. We have, now we have a lot of good, you know, the good Wicca kind of witches, those people. Sure. Um, but we also have the Hexen and they are historically not so good. Um, and there are still some of those out and about there today. Uh, I mean, what, what's it like there where you are? <laughs> How's that? New England is a melting pot. So neo-paganism is probably uh, the dominant methodology of those who practice witchcraft. Um, there are a lot of Wiccans. There are a growing number actually of traditional witches. Um, a lo lot of folks here are based off of the Cabot tradition of witchcraft or Christopher Penzik's um, school of witchcraft from Salem, New Jersey out there. And they've, they've carried over. There's a lot of people in those types of traditions. Um, those who work in the traditional craft and, and are more geared towards that begin to delve in something probably a lot similar to Hexerai or the Hex in there. I would imagine that uh, they work in a similar level. So there begins to become a darker and deeper element that uh, they begin to dwell in and utilize. Um, so it's definitely here for sure. But I think neo-paganism, Wicca, things along that line um, is pertaining to witchcraft. When we say witchcraft here, it's probably the most common thing that we see. Yeah, you know, I, I'd be willing to bet, too, that here, even here, the people who are claiming to be Hexen are probably neo-pagan in some way. Um, mm. Maybe not so much the traditional Hexen, which is probably why they get so angry when we say, well, Hexen are historically this and that, and they don't like that. Yeah. Because maybe they're not that in this day and age, but you can't erase history. Um, anyway, okay. let's... Uh, I got an email. Wait, I'm going to start with this one. Okay. Um, and you might get these kind of emails now, but once you really put yourself out there, you'll get them. Uh, two here that I thought were interesting. Does, does a powwow have a working altar for daily re religious observance or for brock work? Mm, that's a great one. And I yeah. think that's really common. There have been some that I am aware of that took the simplistic nature and, and the faith-based nature of, of powwow, which I think is just one of the most beautiful aspects of it, is that simplistic religious nature of it. It's incredible. Um, and people have brought that into hermeticism and then created these elaborate altars and we have neo-paganism which kind of have been slipped in there and it's things begin to kind of build off of that so my personal reply is that within powwow practice especially in the pennsylvania dutch practice and i could say um in the carolina dutch traditions that or practices that i've seen i have never ever seen anyone with an with a powwow altar um any altars that someone has, has had in their home or their place of practice has been based off of their personal faith, Orthodox, Catholic, things along that line, and was not specifically powwow. So how about for you? Um, uh, that's exactly the answer I would have given. Um, yeah, it seems, it seems a, a product of, and, it, and not that we have to keep harping on neo-paganism, but neo-paganism no, really did, a, it did a lot to bring magical folk traditions back into yes. popular culture, Absolutely. but it did a lot of damage at the same time with false history and poor scholarship and poor academia. So double-edged sword. Um, but correct, I've only ever seen, I've seen people, I myself have had like little prayer shrines and such, you know, mm -hmm. statues of the Blessed Mother, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but not a powwow altar, no. And certainly not for any kind of like, I wouldn't do any work at an altar like that. Not within the powwow tradition, no. Right. Um, but here's another, here's another email that 
This one, I don't know how to answer because I've never seen this. So maybe you have. Um, what is the spiritual meaning of using a seam ripper in powwow? So I had to look up a seam ripper and apparently it's for- Because I love to sew. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it's for sewing. And like, and at, at first I thought, I have no idea. I've never actually even seen a seam ripper. But then I thought, well, there are some, some of the old school charms where you would sew the pouch, like yeah. inside the clothing or the shirt yeah. or something. So maybe the seam ripper was, you know, you tear the seam with it and put the pouch inside, I guess. I don't, I don't know about a spiritual meaning um, because we don't have like sacred spiritual tools yeah. or whatever. Right. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Do you ever see that? I've never seen it. Well, first and foremost, no, that's I'm really, that's, that's kind of a, a seam ripper as a spiritual tool I'm, I'm highly unfamiliar with. I have some slight speculations of what they might be referring to, but I want to preface what I say that none of this is, it's like none of it is, is authoritative or anything. It's just my own two cents and that's all. So take it with a grain of salt, if you will. But I, I think the, I think you hit the nail on the head. I like the idea of in, in Palo how we would have little, what some people may now consider Brauka bags or whatever, but um, historically, you know, a little square thing sewn together, pop a charm in there, sew it in your clothing, like you said. Um, I think one of the, maybe the symbolic meanings of the scene ripper is really opening up and separating. So maybe separating oneself from whatever the issue is having and using that scene to separate oneself and then sewing that Brauka bag in there or, or that, that little charm, whatever you are going to call it, and, and then resealing that and closing that. So if I had to guess, and that's all that it is, I would think it would have to do with some sort of some spiritual separation. But I'm not 100% on that because it's the first time I've ever heard that. Yeah, I've never seen it. I've never come across it. I've never had anybody tell me they use it. So either. Um, yeah, it was just an interesting email. It was part of a greater email. There was some really good commentary in there. But that part really just kind of stood out and I didn't have an answer for her. Um, I'd love to hear more about it if somebody out there wants to drop anything in the comments of your video here. I mean, I definitely would love to hear someone else's input about that. Oh yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, you can. Even though this is not live, it'll be recorded and then put on YouTube. Please put any questions in the commentary. One of us will get back to you. It'll be awesome to hear your questions, and we'll we'll try and answer all of them. Um, uh, we were having a conversation, you and I, about um, well, not just you and I, but a few other people about um, Lee Gandy's book, The Strange yeah. Experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was thinking, it was on my mind today while I was at work. It's been a long time since I read that book. Um, I have it somewhere, but a couple things started popping out of my memory about that. One was that every time he would pow out, he would go into a separate room and put on a hat. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> and uh, I've talked about this before, various things, do pow outs, wear hats and such. And I think, well, for some charms you might want to because it calls for it. But um, what do you think of that? What do you... What do you <laughs> You wear a hat. <laughs> I, you know, I'm on. There, there is definitely some some spiritual meaning with that that pertains to head coverings. Nothing that has to do with magical, uh, any sort of underlying magical conditions and things like that, um, from a theological perspective. But hats often, you know, symbolize covering, for instance, and us being under the cover of God and His protection, things like that. So I can kind of understand where that where that comes from however i i think he is the only person at least in my research and in my conversations that i've ever heard of wearing a hat specifically for to do their power work um i have heard of other people in in the past though really um they they draw the whole hat instance because of it's like this iconic notion of the amish or some mennonites and they automatically connect something like pennsylvania german power with immediately with Mennonites and in Pennsylvania Dutch and that's actually a big thing that I have experienced here in New England is people immediately think immediately as soon as you say Pennsylvania Dutch it has to be an Amish Mennonite tradition so that's interesting and I'd love to get your input on that by the way yeah we uh um you're right, because you think Pennsylvania Dutch, you think hex signs on the Amish barns, and they're doing powwow. And, like, everything about that is incorrect. Um, 
because hex signs are not part of powwow. The Amish would never have a hex sign on their barns. Right. And the Amish were, now there are some instances where the Amish did practice powwow. Um, the Mennonites, very much opposed to it, yeah. very much against it. Um, you know, the Mennonites, uh, the Mennonites are great for their herbal remedies, but don't, they don't want powwow. And uh, where the Amish are actually a little more open-minded than the Mennonites, believe it or not. Um, but no, the uh, Pennsylvania German culture in itself, um, you can tell all of us in Pennsylvania German culture because we all do have a lot of the same, you know, we have the same upbringings. We all, we're up, we were brought up in rural settings. We all do gardening and farming and such things. Um, mm. You know, people have thought that I was Amish. Um, and actually somebody once said to me, this was online. It was on MySpace. Remember that? MySpace? Oh, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, long yeah. before Facebook. <laughs> somebody said, you are the nicest gay Amish man I ever met on the internet. <laughs> That's awesome. I couldn't wrap my head around it. There was just so much going on with that statement. But um <laughs> anyway, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's uh, awesome, bro. Yeah, but no, the, the I love that you remember that that clearly too. That's great. <laughs> just because it was so ridiculous, it was so funny, and like I, every once in a while, I throw that out there. But um, yeah, no, the Amish. Uh, you won't really find a lot of talk about powwow with the Amish, even though some have done it. I actually know a former Amish person who chose the path of hexerai. And this was years ago, and he was kind of my role model for a while. I wanted to be him because he was the powwow, and he was like the hexenmeister, and I really just wanted to be this guy. And uh, until somebody said, you don't, because it's taking a toll on him, which we will discuss this in our course that we do in yeah. January, This the price you pay. But right. anyway, I'm going off track here, which I do. Um, it's okay. But yeah, go ahead. Anyway. I don't know. Did that answer? What was the question? I don't know. <laughs> no, you did actually. Yeah, we, okay. we, it was just the question was pertaining to your thoughts on everyone thinking that Powell was automatically Amish Mennonite. So you mm, did mm, actually mm, touch mm. upon that quite well. Yeah, no, for sure. No. Um, but I will tell you, it is within, at least in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania German culture, um, it's Christian without exception. There are no exceptions to that. If you are not a Christian, you are not a powwow. There are some who claim to be that are neo-pagan or whatever. They are not. They they don't understand it. That I think that is the biggest difference that I found from what's called Carolina Dutch and Pennsylvania Dutch. The biggest difference in their healing practice would, where Pennsylvania will say, you know, they'll try. The, it's called trying. And the Pennsylvania Dutch, I mean, excuse me, the Carolina Dutch will, they call it use or using but they're considered, they consider themselves faith healers. However, the interesting thing is, like you said, it's, it's without question, it, God is part of that, where there, there's still elements of paganism involved in that. Some of the charms involve Woden, for instance. Um, and in the, same, in the same charm has to do with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's, it's really interesting, and that's a lot of the same things are being used, long lost friend, things along that line, but there's a really different expression. So I think that's like my love for Pennsylvania Dutch powwow is that that spiritual purity, that that I love that connection. So and I, I think it's um I think that also on a spiritual level um brings a level of protection that you don't have when you're trying to operate outside of that, like in the Carolina Dutch tradition. So I, I, I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I think uh, for years I studied alternative religions and such, and I started mm -hmm. initially learning about powwow through a neo-pagan lens, and it did not seem correct to me. It didn't feel right. You know what I mean? It just didn't feel right. And uh while a lot of those things were fun to learn, I never believed in that. You know what I mean? I always kind of went back to my roots. I was raised Catholic and my father's side of the family was German reform. So I always kind of went back to Christ, you know, and just did, that felt true to me. And I thought, what am I doing? Why is this doesn't feel correct to me? So yes, I'm with you. There is a level of protection. There is like this 
there's a certain level of power that comes with the Christian tradition that you just cannot find elsewhere, at least in my experience. Um, that's interesting about the Carolina Dutch, though, because until tonight, until we were talking, I had never heard of that before. Wow. So my experience, I guess, with that would be the, um, the Silver John books. You know the Silver John? No. Okay. Well, a friend of mine you turned me on. Fun, but I don't hear it. Silver so. John, a guy who he has a guitar with silver strings, travels the mountains in the Carolinas, and uh, fights demons and such using the silver strings on his guitar and a long lost friend. I have to find this because that is amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. A friend turned yeah. me on to it a couple of months ago. I ordered, I found the book on Amazon. Then I found a movie on YouTube. There's a movie. It was made in like 1969 or something. Uh, and now yeah. Silver John is like, kind of like, what, what would Silver John do in this? And he's fighting off demons and monsters and everything. Anyway. Uh, I am on it. I will have that book tonight. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Totally it. worth it. Yeah, it's a, it's a book you carry in your back pocket and you just keep reading the stories over again. What was Silver John doing in this instance? Fantastic. Uh, um, so yeah, people are probably watching us right now wondering what we're talking about. Uh, here's another email I got. This is a good one. And I have my own thoughts on this. I'm interested to hear yours. But, you know, mainly uh, I want whoever's watching this to understand that we want to give you the right answer. And even if you're not in Pennsylvania, I hope this shows that you don't have to be here in Pennsylvania to be a powwow, obviously. Sure. And things do change as they travel. You know, I mean, people were doing the, using the long lost friend in West Virginia and it traveled further South and eventually yeah. even people in Louisiana are using it and that's in hoodoo. So that's mm -hmm. very different. So you can see that, um, you know, but anyway, uh, I don't know where I was going with this, but I want to read this email. Um, I was always taught to, to, I was, I was always taught to reveal your real name is to give someone power over you. Why do mm -hmm. you insist on your patients giving you their baptismal name? Okay. I was always taught to reveal your real name is to give someone power over you. Why do you insist on patients giving you their baptismal name? First of all, um, I do it because it's tradition to ask for the person's, the patient's, client's, whatever, baptismal name. But also that's how you're introduced. You're first introduced to God that way. And so when I think we're petitioning God to say your baptismal name, God, not to make God like us, but he'll be like, oh, yeah, I know who you mean. You know what I mean? Like that's, I don't know. What do you think of that? Uh, the use of the baptismal name. Some people seem I, to have a problem with it. I, I have two thoughts, I think, on that. One, um, I think that right along the line with what you said, your baptismal name um, is an immediate identification, one, and in, in proof positive to an effect that you are a Christian. What is one of the first questions that Paul asked their clients? Do you believe in God or do you believe in God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Um, so by them stating their baptismal name and not just their given name, um, it's a confirmation of that. So I think that's that's one. And perhaps that, that's my speculation on why that's part of tra the tradition itself. Number two, um, I'm very heavily involved in deliverance ministry. One of the things that we, when we do when we deal with the demonic is there are times where we need to be able to identify what that thing is because it has, we, we can then, it has certain attributes uh, or attributes that we can identify and we know different ways that it operates uh, to be able to remove this thing if need be. And I'm under the impression that often this, this statement that our given name it's, you know, we, using that, it holds some sort of power because of that. There's a longstanding tradition, especially in the Orthodox churches like uh, um, the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholic Church, things along that, that line of utilizing that. And I think the, those names, uh, the uh, using names in deliverance and such is, is kind of, almost the, the counterfeit of God giving that baptismal name and us utilizing that, having that sort of identification. So I think there's, there's, a, there's like a, 
a true tradition and a counterfeit tradition. This is kind of a large subject to talk about, so I'm going to try and not dwindle on this. Um, but ultimately, I don't think necessarily that the baptismal name needs to be had. For instance, I was Baptist. I was baptized um, Methodist. We are not given baptismal names. So what do you do in that situation then? If the person doesn't have it, then we use their given name. I mean, that's that's our option. If you don't have that baptismal name. Well, it was always my understanding that when you were baptized, what your name was when you were baptized, that's your baptismal name. But then okay. in the Catholic Church, like I was raised Catholic and I was confirmed when I was in whatever grade and I was given a new name, mm. which is how I got the middle name Matthew, um, because you have to choose a name. So, yeah, is that the correct name? Is my, is my baptismal name what it was at birth or was it what it was after confirmation? I suppose what it was when I was baptized, but... And now I'm married. I have a different, my name is very different now than it was when I was born. Okay. And, uh, you know, but I think I like the idea of using the baptismal name. What was the name that you were, you know, to me, it's the name that you were introduced to the church as, I suppose. You were first introduced to God when you had the water poured on your head or you were thrown in a bucket of water, whatever they do, <laughs> tossed I you in the river. Um, yeah, I, I love the varying perspectives of that. It's, it's one I haven't, you know, I never really considered that whatever name you had when you were baptized, that's your baptismal name. Um, the way that I have always been taught was that your baptismal name was given to you in some traditions, uh, was given to you when you were baptized, so like the Roman Catholics, things like that. I remember my mom's was like Beatrice. Um, so she had ties to that baptismal name, but I never was given one like that, so we just use our given name. To, okay, so I, you the idea that that's your actual baptismal name. I love that. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm going to definitely inherit that. <laughs> so yeah. I, that's great. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So well, my, that was a good email question, then. So one question to you, real quick, and pertaining to this as well, since you're the the longtime seasons guy, is what if the person's never been baptized? Can they still be powwowed? Well. I, my thought is, yes, is, you know, do you believe in God? Mm -hmm. um, sure, people don't, if they, if they haven't been baptized, then what was the name you were born with? Uh, and then, you know, I guess it's kind of our way out in Powell, we say, I will try. I will try. Uh, I don't know how important um, certain specifics are, because to me, it's that triangle that you and I kind of discussed recently. It's like, yeah, God is present. I'm there. And the person's belief and it creates that sort of link. Those are the things mm -hmm. that matter. If I don't have his baptismal name, I feel like God will know who I'm talking about. He can see it, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. But certainly I believe that adds something to it. It does add something because it, it proves, like you said, they're a Christian. Yeah. And they were welcomed into the church at an early age. So they already had that blessing on them. Um, but again, we could take that forever and just go on and, on and on and on. So let's pause the recording, take a quick break. Maybe I'll insert a commercial of something in here and then uh, we'll come back. So hang on one second. Nobody go anywhere. Please put comments in the uh, comments. comment box below. Yeah. yeah. And we'll be back in one second. Okay, we're back. So one of the things I wanted to um, kind of talk about was because people come from all around uh, Pennsylvania, not that they come, but they contact me from all around uh yeah. the united states wherever i'll say you know how can they learn to be powwow what can they do um what do you think does it matter do you think it matters if you're from pennsylvania i don't think so uh what do you think what advice do we have to offer those people what's the best way to get started with being a powwow i would say first and foremost 
I'm living proof that you Sorry smart. about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think uh, I'm living proof that you don't have to be from Pennsylvania to be involved in power. So uh, that's first. Second thing is there are resources out there. There are some really great source material that you can delve into to explore the topic. Um, the first place I would probably send anyone to, which was huge for me, was your website. So PA German Powwow. Um, and I, I would say, you know, some, someone should go and explore. You have more material than an encyclopedia on that website. So you can be prepared to spend months there. But you'll get the idea of what powwow entails. And you're not getting nonsense. You're going to get something that is real quality and authentic. Um, I think that's first. Second thing is, I think, for me, at least, it's something I prayed about. Is this, you know, am I even called to this? Um, like you, I have have a history of some other paths. And um, fortunately for me, it's what really kind of led me to where I am. But um, the, the material is there if that's something you're called to. Because I do believe that powwow is a calling. Not everyone subscribes to that, and that's okay. Um, and I think uh, lastly is... If you feel that you're called to that, there's things you can do. Try. Um, get the long lost friend. Try some simple charms. See, see what works. Um, for me, stopping blood was the first one that I ever that I ever did. Um, and I found that, holy cow, like this is this is good for me. This is working. So then um, blowing fire was was the next and and so on for me. So um, I think trial and error and working towards that. And I don't think it really necessarily is important where you live um, or even if you are Pennsylvania Dutch or not. I do think, however, it is really important to also learn about Pennsylvania Dutch culture because there's a lot of that attached to powwow and that is something that has really helped me immensely in understanding how this works so i would say those those three points so read do your thing pray and learn about pennsylvania dutch culture because it's inseparable from pennsylvania dutch powwow i agree i wouldn't have said it i couldn't have said it any better and that's the thing like you just pick it up and because a lot of people throughout history, their only education in powwow was they got a copy of the long lost friend mm. and it worked for them. And right. that's what I always say. It will either work for you or it will not. I you don't know until you try. You don't know. Yeah. Yep. Don't know. I not everything, not everything we do is going to be successful. For sure. That, that's for sure. I think, um, you know, I, I love, I love that word that you, you know, you use try. That's very much part of Pennsylvania. You try. And one of the most relaxing things to me, one of the most stress relieving aspects of powwow is that it's not relying upon me. I will do everything that I can do. I can try, but ultimately the end result is not in my hands. So I don't have to carry around any sort of massive weight at that point and uh, worrying about reputation and notoriety. And I think that's why Pennsylvania Dutch powwow, part of that is, is, has been so kind of obscure to a point because most powwows don't reach for notoriety. And, you know, even many teachers are, you know, here you go, here's your charm. Don't mention my name. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. that's so, exactly right. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, um, it's. I annoy myself with the fact that I'm like as public as I am. But part of that is part of well, a large part of what I do is in response to the misinformation that was put out there about powwow, and so many people picked up on that 
version of powwow, that incorrectness, that mm -hmm. wrongness, that somebody had to come out and be out against that. And so that's why I am so public with it, you know, and it's good because I, you know, I appreciate the commentary on the website because that tells me that, uh, you know, I'm doing a good job. I'm putting everything I learned, I put on that site or I put it out here in a video or whatever, because it's to combat the misinformation. Do I need to be this public? Only in the sense that I want to combat the bad stuff. And it's still out there. We still, you and I both have met people yeah. or conversed with people that are still kind of under that false impression of what powwow is. So there's still work to be done. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm not the only one out there. We have like our friend, Michael, he has started a blog. He's working on that. And you, if I'm allowed to say this, you are working on, um, an awesome blog. It's very nice looking. I'm really, really happy with it. Uh, I love looking at it and reading what I've read so far. Is it powwowdoctor.com? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Powwowdoctor.com. Yeah. Exactly. So I, you guys should yeah. definitely check that out because this is now another option. Like, it's not just me being the powwow guy. There are other powwow guys out there. So I'm really, really happy about that. Um, you have no idea. <laughs> it's been a lonely yeah, I, travel. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And, and I really hope that you look at it as, you know, kind of another another flame lit from the torch that you're carrying. Because really, that's what it is for me. Like, my torch in this was lit based off of the work that you put out there because you are public. Um, and if you weren't, I don't necessarily know that I would have came to this. I would have known something similar, but different and not even near as in-depth. So what you're doing is absolutely, I think, vital and important. And it's an answer to a lot of our own, you know, a lot of our own prayers and seeking out our paths and stuff. So you're a torchbearer for sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, one thing I have to say though, now you just patted my back. I had to pat yours because I read a blog you posted today. Um, and the various things that I've read that you've written, like you just have this super theological, like incredible theological knowledge and this academic knowledge and the way of writing things and footnotes and citations and such. I'm just a practitioner. So my, my blog posts are like, this is what I do. It's four sentences long. I add some pictures. And then yours are these amazing works of like academia and theology. So that's, that is so important to have that. You know what I mean? Um, so that's why I definitely would urge people to check out powwowdoctor.com. Um, and it's new. So it's, yeah, brand new. Stuff still a work, yeah, still a work in progress. Um, so I I appreciate your, your compliments, by the way, immensely. I, I think I'm, I'm rather mediocre in, in my understanding compared to yours, for sure. Mm. Um, and I really, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that the work that I do will complement what you have. You have so much out there and it's yours is very practical and simple. And it's definitely the place to go for folks who are new to this in exploring or the seasoned practitioner who needs to really look at further at some charms and needs quick access and maybe wants these things explained. Um, mine, I think is kind of, I'm hoping not so much to pair your site, but to, complement your site where we can kind of explore things in, in a little bit more more depth so uh, things that may be difficult topics such as what I just wrote about that you read regarding powwow is is this forbidden in the bible the bible says these things so what now and you recently got that question asked in in your last uh, interview on dark sun rising which if anyone hasn't heard they should go to your website because you have it right there on the front page uh, they can listen to that. It, would, it was a great interview. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that immensely. Um, that's my hope. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. No, I, I don't like mind. That. I, I wanted to circle back for a second because you mentioned you mentioned something previously, right before this, um, in regards to the new practitioner trying because you don't know what works for you um, until you try it. So, my question to you, as the seasoned practitioner, is for you, what do you know what doesn't work for you? I imagine you would have by now. And what do you do 
in that situation? Like these things don't work for you. How do you deal with the client that comes to you and says, you know, I need you to do this and, and it, you know, it doesn't work for you. Well, that's it. Okay. Well, I appreciate that question. I, uh, one thing I can tell you, and I've always been very honest about my power and very upfront with people. Um, people have come to me with mental health issues. I'm rubbish at it. There's very little the power of source material offers insofar as mental health issues. So I've tried to um, tweak things to be more mental health oriented. I've tried, you know, I've tried all kinds of things for mental health issues and brought bags and prayers and everything else. And I just, I've got nothing because, I, you know, mental health is such a layered thing it's going to take more than a charm it takes therapy and counseling and such so power is probably not the best for that um another thing i have to say is skin disorders rashes and such now i've read articles and such where people were amazing at this i'm no good i'm no good and uh one of the very first people i've ever tried for it was at a public event at our church uh, it was myself, Chris Bellardi, the author, and uh, yeah. we were doing a powwow presentation at our church. Um, the church was the Red Church. That's oh, you know, and, uh, okay, yeah. So the the uh, people were there, and this woman had some sort of skin disorder, and I I tried for her, and um, I was not successful. And I had a woman come to my home several years after that. And she had, I don't know if it was shingles, I forget, but um, I was not successful. And she was very angry with me. She, uh, she said, I can't believe I drove all the way to your house. You're a fraud. <laughs> I'm so disappointed in you. And uh, I say, you know, it's, it's, I try. That's all I can say is I'll try. Um, yeah. But apparently that's not the gift that God has given me. So what about you? Have you got anything yet? Uh, I, th I think there's twofold for me, really. I, you know, I'm 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 fairly new in this, also. Um, so just very recently putting myself out here, and so there are plenty of things that I have not encountered yet. So I just don't know, and I don't think I will know until I try. So to kind of mimic your your words at that, if, you know, previously, um, yeah, but. The other for me is definitely skin rashes for sure. I have done two and to no avail at this point. Um, and the others are arthritis. Oh, and I will tell, I will say this. If I work on somebody for arthritis, it is terrible for me. And I don't know if that is part of the issue, maybe you have an answer for this or, or insight, actually. I don't know if, if that is part of the issue with them not receiving that healing. I don't know. It's to the point where it's just something I don't try for anymore because quite frankly, I'm not the one for you. Uh, okay. To, especially arthritis. And, and I think that's going back to what you said also is you're very honest about what you can and cannot do. I find that that is extremely important in this practice. One, if we're going to be taken seriously at all, intellectual integrity or integrity in general is vastly important. So, um, yeah, if, if you reach out to me for arthritis, the answer is, I'm sorry, I cannot handle that for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, we have to be that way. We have to be honest with people. Um, we can't give people false hope. Mm. It's really important. We can say we'll try, but it's, you know, it's, you know, the power that works, it's God. It's, you know, all thanks, praise and glory go to God. You know, um, I have no power of my own save that which God has put through me. But um, oh, I just had this great thought and now it's gone. You gave me this great thought and now I lost it. But um, I guess we could talk about, though. Uh, if someone does come to us, you know, like when someone comes to me, the one thing that people are nervous about, what's going to happen? You know, are you going to be like putting your hands all over me and touching me and stuff? Well, I would tell you, Pablo is very much a hands-on kind of thing. And you see that in the source material. It's like, yeah, for sure. uh, you know, in all cases, the hands are laid upon the bare skin. I mean, it's very much a, 
you know, it's, it's non-politically correct in that sense that if somebody comes to me, basically what will happen is I will seat them in a chair facing east. I will go through that. Do you believe in God? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, yes. Um, state your baptismal name. They state it. And then I'll use that in whatever charm I'm working. Let's just say they're sitting there and I'm working some sort of pain or sickness charm or whatever. And then I'll work that over them. Uh, but that will take some time because you have to do that way to yeah. space, do that three more times, way to space, do it through, what it, you know, whatever you're doing might take a little bit of time. Um, generally speaking, I ask the patient to hold a Bible on their lap. Yeah. Um, and I also ask people, don't think of anything. Don't try to force anything. It's not necessary that you pray while doing this. Just relax. Just close your eyes and relax. Just think about feeling better, whatever. Um, and I work the charm, and when I'm done, I send them on their way. And every once in a while, I give people what I call a homework assignment. Um, hmm. And I feel I feel like it's divine inspiration that tells me this. Like, go on home, read the book of Matthew, you'll be all right. Um, it's just every once in a while, I get inspired to tell people, go on home. You know what I mean? Read, you know, whatever, read this psalm, this psalm, and this psalm, and, you know, um, it's kind of like something I add as part of the ritual, mm -hmm. the healing ritual. Uh, not everybody, though, so that's what you can get when you come to me. Um, I've never actually heard of that. I like the homework aspect. It's something I haven't considered. That's it's interesting. I love that. Do you think that... Um, your approach in that with especially with the homework that this is your your personal little touch to your powwow practice um, yeah maybe i guess so because i've i've never read or heard of anybody doing it it's just there, oh, you're the first yeah the very first time i felt inspired to tell somebody uh i was powering for a lady and uh I, it just came to me i said you know what then when you go home I want you to read Matthew. And uh, she said, oh, I'm definitely going to do that. Thank you so much. And uh, I just thought that felt right to me to say that. And so I don't always give people a homework, but sometimes yeah. I do. And it feels like, I just feel like I'm meant to, they're meant to learn something from that. You know, that's, it's God working through you. I don't force anything. So. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So for me, it's extremely similar to what you do. A uh, person will come over. I usually sit them in a chair facing east. Same deal. I have a Bible that I utilize uh, consistently with. They usually will hold that. Um, there's a lot of telltales in that. It can probably be a whole other conversation in itself. But um, we'll go through. Do you believe? I usually will say, do you believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Um, not everyone is Trinitarian, but um, if, if they were to kind of refute that, I usually will then ask if, if do you believe in God? And we will proceed from there. I'll ask them what their baptismal name was. Um, I love the new understanding that I gained from you today, by the way, regarding that. So that's something I'm going to utilize. Um, and then we'll go about whatever it is that we're doing, like you said, for healing or whatever it is that we're doing, go through our movements. If they're, if they're new, I do like to explain to them that there's going to be some touching sometimes, you know, you, you have your hands where you're doing specific rubber movements, maybe from the neck and down or, or whatever, and there's sweeping movements. And um, there are times where I, I am very much inclined to utilize my Bible in, in that, um, in usually in cleansing type ways. So um, often, actually, um, and that works very well for me. Um, and then I will usually pray at the end of that as well. Um, I'll answer any questions they might have because sometimes people are like, well, what are you saying? Uh, I, I don't know how you operate. I'm very quiet when I'm saying what needs to be said in the midst of my work. Um, so kind of a cross between a whisper and a mumble, I guess. Um, and then my process usually goes, I'll do whatever needs to be done. And then I usually have another 30 minutes, it's done again, and then 30 minutes. So it's just a little over an hour usually. And then I will have them repeat this three consecutive, so it's three consecutive weeks. So what we end up having is three times three, you know, three, three, and three, we end up with nine, which is the triple trinity. So 
there's some sort of um, spiritual connection involved in that as well. So that's kind of how things operate for me. Okay. Yeah. Yours is it. Yeah. It's very similar. Yours might be slightly more involved than mine, but that's, it's, it is what it is. It's how we do things. It's what people can expect when they come to us. Um, and that's important to know too. So if you, uh, if you reach out to one of us or, you know, any powwow or that's kind of, it's kind of the baseline of what you might get, what you can expect. Uh, it is a hands-on. It's not going to be weird. No, or like for sure. Inappropriate or anything like that. No. It's just, it is what it is. It's just, uh, you know, human touch is so important though. I mean, it really is. It like, it lets you know somebody's there. You, you know, you can feel when somebody cares, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I think we've lost that. You know, we've lost that sense of it. And so people are like, hands off, hands off. And uh, I don't know. I think when it comes to healing, human touch is very important, but absolutely yeah um well i think this has been a great discussion and i think it definitely opens the door for further discussions but i think we've kept these people too long uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so any questions please put them down in the comments um this video will be up in you know once i get it up and running i have to piece some things together and such but it'll be up forever uh and then you can uh, reach Jason at powwowdoctor.com or me at PA German powwow. Wait. Yep. PA German powwow.com. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. Or just send us commentary here and we'll get it. Um, so anyway, uh, do you have any last parting thoughts for anybody? Just, I think ultimately, if this is a path that you're pursuing, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, there are people like yourself, myself, Michael, for an, another one. Um, his is genuinebrowkarai.com, I believe. Yes. Um, and he's another great resource. So reach out, ask questions. No question is stupid. So sling it out there if you have one. And uh, spend some time researching. Explore. It's, it's, it's definitely available to you if, if it's something you want to do. And, you know... I think you should mention your program one more time real quick. If there's someone who's watching this that's new, you know, you're getting ready to do the six-week course, which is oh, yeah. the group itself is phenomenal right now. So I think that's something maybe you might want to mention real brief because I think it's important. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm doing a six-week Zoom course um, beginning in January. So it'll run every Monday in January and the first Monday of February, six Mondays in a row. Uh I'm teaching the essentials of powwow, what it is, where it comes from, how to do it. And I'm going to actually teach you how to do charms. So by the end of the course, you will be a functioning and full-fledged powwow. Um, that's it. There is a way to register for it on my uh, pagermanpowwow.com. You'll see a little link at the top, the powwow essentials course. Uh, just click on that and just follow that. Um, yeah, it's going to be great. So, uh, and we have a nice community forum. There's like 25 people already signed up for it. It's a good community. We have a little private uh, Google group where you get information that we don't share here. We don't great share publicly. Yeah, sure. it's really good. So that's all I've got. Awesome. Well, I look forward to doing this again. And I uh, thank everybody who sits through this and listens to it. Yeah. Thank you, Jason David. And Thank you, everyone, for watching. We love you very much. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next time. As soon as I figure out how to do that, okay.